Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Unapologetically Joy. My name is Joy, I'm the host of this podcast and today we got another special guest and that is Nish. And she's the host of the Oblix podcast and the Cosmic Saloon podcast where she's inviting a lot of interesting people to talk about several subjects like consciousness, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, the matrix, the cabal, uh, spirituality in general, uh, you name it. I think Nice is a really good example for being unapologetically yourself. She doesn't care what people think and yeah, she's living just her true self and I really like that. And uh, yeah, that really inspires me. We had a really personal conversation and she shared with us how she dealt with her childhood traumas and hardships. How do you stay connected to yourself and how to practice self-love? You will find all the answers in this episode. But before we go to the episode, don't forget to follow us on Spotify, subscribe on our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and don't forget to leave five stars. It really helps me to boost my podcast. So thank you so much and let's go to the episode. Enjoy. Welcome, Nish. Thank you, Joy. It is a great pleasure to be here. Nice. Welcome. And I was wondering uh, what or who brought you on the spiritual path? Ooh, that's always an interesting <laughs> thing to try and nail down in language. I was, and I consider this fortunate, I was fortunate to not have had church and I mean church, not religion, church brought into my life and forced upon me as a child. So I was able to explore when I wanted and how I wanted. And so I basically grew up with a relationship, uh, a close relationship with nature and a love for being in the woods and being by water, a love for natural animals, animals in general. And those things inspired me and informed me er very early on. And then as I got a little bit older, I guess my, my momo was kind of a new agey type person. And so that stuff was around me and there was some, some kind of basic religion around me, but nothing, I never was in church or anything and nobody ever really said anything towards me. So I didn't grow up with the Bible or any, any of that. So even though I think if you ask these people, they would tell you they were Christian or yeah, it would be different types of Christian, like Protestants or Catholics. And myself, I decided that I wanted to learn different things at different times. So I went on a long journey that started with, what am I doing here? Why am I here? I was very conscious as a, at a very early age that I was in a construct. And this set the path for my life. I had a memory of being in my flesh before I was six months old and my momo and I talked about this later and she confirmed it was had to have been before I was six months old because of the room and the house I talked about. I guess I'd moved at six months. They had moved. And so the spaces I was identifying were from the first place I lived. So that gave me a clue as to how early I was being a conscious being. And then my mom also insisted that I learned to read and write very early. And I did. And so did my brother and my cousin. It was like very much something that she felt we needed to get on the ball with very, very early. So we all started in here in America, what we call preschool, being able to read and write. And mm. of course, you you know, it gets perfected in, in that, but we, no one else was reading and writing. 
they were just little, you know, toddlers, basically. So we mm -hmm. already had that advantage. And as I started to grow and question what was going on, like a lot of kids wondering what the nature of reality was, why do we perceive color? I remember being very fascinated by the color of things, like the, how beautiful grass is and how uh, trees when their leaves were turning and stuff like that, and, and the brilliant blue sky, things like that. And then purple butterflies and the bees with the, ye the yellow jackets, you know, with the yellow and the black. And I was fascinated by the depth of color in nature, and I really desperately wanted to know how that happened. How do we get color? And so those were questions I started to present to the adults in my life. And many of them had no idea. You know, it was, <laughs> it was uh, just, that's the way things were. And so that led me into exploring nature at a deeper level. And as I started to explore nature at a deeper level, I encountered naturalists out there and people that were um, more alternative in their views and Wiccans and stuff like that. And uh, I started to get into tarot. And that the reason I got into tarot was because I became very fascinated with Egypt at a very early age. And again, my momo. Um, I had encyclopedias of mysteries and stuff and, and Egypt, she knew I was obsessed with Egypt. So she would buy me everything she could that was on ancient Egypt in the old kingdom. And I, at that point, actually wanted to make that a life study. Now, remember, I'm a little kid. And so I got my hands on an Egyptian set of tarot that was, it's no longer made. I can't find anything about it. I'd given it away long ago, but it was really more like flashcards to teach you about the different gods from the old kingdom and also the hieroglyphs, hieroglyphics and the mythos around that period in Egypt. And so that led me into all the mystery teachings. And as I moved through my life and in and out of different mystery teachings, looking for answers, because that's what the trajectory of my life has been. Looking for answers. What is the nature of reality? What is the nature of God? What am I? How do I play into this? How do others play into this? These queries informed my path. And so my religious aspect, my deep spirituality formed naturally on its own and of its own. And I, to this day, still have this laurel. However, from that point to this point, I, I checked out a lot of different religions because I want to know. I want to understand what people think. I want to understand what the greats were thinking. I want to understand, you know, when I wanted to understand Jesus, I, I dove deep. I wanted to understand this story. And I found myself all along, though, the one thing that stayed with me was this idea of the great mother, the mother of God. And mm -hmm. so um, that I have found in every religion everywhere. And I devoted my life basically at a young age to the, the mother of God. And so if you're in my house and you're in old Europe and you're from old Europe, I, my house is filled with beautiful old Madonnas, many from old Europe. Black Madonnas, the all forms. I love my favorite Madonna. Those Our Lady of Sorrows are the Dolores, Dolores, and she is all over my house. There's something about that suffering Madonna, where she's suffering the sins of the world, where she feels the sins of everyone. Her empathic nature inspired me because on the underbelly of my life has been riddled with a lot of hardships and a lot of sorrows myself. So I naturally gravitated to 
this imagery and it, it brought me and still does brings me a sense of home, a sense of mama. Um, my mother died long ago and it, it just all became part of a bigger narrative for me. So where I stand today is, is basically in the same spot is I'm still looking for the answers. I saw yeah. it as a young child and I feel very much more informed, but the deeper you look, the more mysterious everything gets. Mm. Yeah. The more, you know, the more you don't know. Eh? <laughs> exactly. So you, you, you learn one thing and then five more doors open. <laughs> yeah. And how do you think about religion now? Because um, I think it has to do something with spirituality, but also not, I guess. So, um, what do you think about religion in general? Well, I, as far as organized religion, I have a yeah. lot. It's nuanced, Joy. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's all gatekeepers, and they don't all have to be. A, that doesn't have to be a negative thing, right? Mm -hmm. It does not have to be a bad thing. But they are religion gets in the way of your relationship with God or the mm -hmm. source. And that is, that's always been a problem for me in different ways because I don't think anyone can define my experience of God for me. Mm -hmm. No one can translate that. I can translate that. I don't need assistance getting in contact with God. God is there. And uh, so I have that as an innate relationship to God. However, I will say, and I've always said this, I am a lover of beauty, of art, of artis artisanship, of, uh, of culture, and higher thinking, and these higher principles that are very venus very venusian and mm. so with that said i am absolutely and utterly in love with the great basilicas in the world mm -hmm. the great cathedrals in the world even the great mosques in the world all these beautiful structures that came out of praise and came mm. out of of the relationship between the unseen world and the seen world. And so I love these structures, but mm. I'm not in love with the dogma, if you will, of, of them. And then in this time period we're in, we can see how damaging and destructive so many religions have been, especially to women and, yeah. um, and other people. But women have really suffered in the name of religion all across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And I also feel like sometimes people use religion for an excuse, you know, to do anything. So yes. Yeah. For, for example, I believe really in, in the Anunnaki story that, uh, that we are gods, that God is yes. inside of us. Yes. Um, and that we are, um, actually created to work we are just work uh work creatures but we still have this divine in us but we just forgot how to activate it that's what i think well i love that and i've that's that's in a way what i was saying that it's in us and we don't need gatekeepers and it is about self-activation it's an activation and i think that this starts to go hand in hand with some of the systems that run our biology with our say etheric system with all of it the nodes in our body the lymph nodes the um the chakra points all this we're a a magical biology of technology. We are organic technology that is 
not being fully used in a spiritual sense because we have to walk through these processes to activate this stuff within us. And I believe that the keys to activation are all over the realm. They're not just in one place. And I think that's one of the things that people have lost sight of, that not one school of thought has every answer. Mm. Yeah. And I also feel like um, people are really afraid of the truth. So, for example, a lot of people are really distracting themselves with uh, with their phone or with Netflix or with uh, drugs or whatever. And I think if someone is just sitting in silence for one hour, I think it can be also really, yeah, um, yeah, it can already help, you know, to get your thoughts in, in line and to get get closer to, to the source. Well, truth is truth is dangerous. And mm-hmm. that's why there's a war on it. That's why there's censorship. That's why it's been usurped. That was one of the reasons why some of my ancestors fled Europe. Uh, my Dutch ancestors and my French ancestors, uh, the, known as the Huguenots, and mm. uh, they fled Europe because they were being persecuted. And the reason they were being persecuted was they thought that the Bible should be not written in Latin that only a priest could read. They thought it should be the whole Calvinist thing. They thought it should be in the tongue of the people so that anyone could pick this, you know, what they call the word of God up and read it directly instead of needing someone to translate for them. So this is an important thing. That is a form of gaslighting and the church churches in general really, I think, perfected gaslighting and uh, and in, in their control. Now, you said something very significant here, stillness and being still. At the heart of my my life, of my being, and I've, I've, I, I'm not doing this now, but well, I'm doing this practice now, but I'm not doing martial arts at this time because there's no Sifu, which is a, a master in Kung Fu, Kung Fu um, mm. near me for the practice that I have uh, devoted myself to at other points in my life. But what I did learn through some of the internal martial arts is the the concept and then the non-doing of stillness. Now, I learned dead stillness when I was a very, very young child in a bad situation, and it became something I learned naturally on my own. And I, I have such a conviction in the fact that we can find the answers on our own uh, things come to us naturally. We don't have to manipulate to get get answers. It's just a matter of it's never ending. So the idea anyway, what I was getting at, is the idea of stillness and and being quiet, quietude within self is fundamental in any sort of personal ascension into a lucid experience into being lucid within your life, not just in your dream. And I hold this idea of life is a dream from the stuff I encountered reading early Sumerian and Egyptian stuff, early stuff from uh, different first peoples of different cultures like Australia and New Zealand. And Mm -hmm. so this stuff really has had a major impact on my life that I still, um, well, I can't imagine not practicing stillness. And sometimes stillness, there doesn't need to be a practice around it. It's a non-doing. So just sitting and looking out a window Daydreaming, as they used to call it here in the United States, is, you know, and then it was looked down upon, by the way. This is a powerful act. The act of daydreaming can take you to great heights, and I recommend it highly. Mm. Yeah, I feel the same. And I really try to take a time also once a day to just stare 
Um, I'm really lucky that I live at the beach, so I can just stare at the beach. So it's a really nice view, but I can understand for some people, if you're just living in a really busy um, city, then it's not really nice to stare at the window. Or, But um, yeah, I feel it. I feel really like sometimes I really need it to take a step back and just look at the situation because um, I have meetings all day and it can be really draining sometimes. And sometimes I really need a moment to reflect and to see, okay, what is actually happening and what is true? Because your thoughts can can go, yeah, can can be really negative, but maybe there's nothing going on yeah it's it's really good practice also for me yeah yeah it will heal you it heals you and even if if one is in the middle of a busy city or in a place that is lacking some sort of natural beauty Mm -hmm. it's it's this is why i surround myself with things that i find beautiful so i can Mm -hmm. stare off at at an object of art or at an angle on a beautiful wall even and and find myself because it's ultimately not about what you're staring at it's the process of being in that stillness of staring that opens up your internal space and when you get to that point where you can open your internal space up then it it really does not matter what your eyes being cast on, although it is so much nicer to look out at the beautiful water or at, mm-hmm. at the beautiful wood out there in nature or a flower or, you know, it's so much nicer. But you don't need need that to get to this uh, opening space that happens internally. Mm-hmm. And do you also ask questions or are you just still? My, my process of the, the, so the, I don't know what, how to put this, um, language defies me sometimes. The, I do ask, I'm always asking questions, but I don't let the questions happen in my stillness. I allow thoughts to come and go naturally. I don't push them out. I don't ask them to leave. I let them come in and in the process of stillness, they kind of go away and something Mm -hmm. magical happens in that space. But when I am asking questions, when I'm seeking in a spiritual sense through this spiritual practice of, of stillness, I, I go about it in a different way. And I certainly do ask questions and I, I certainly am always on on a path of looking for the synchronicity or the voice of god to inform me and that is just a whole different process it is interesting and then also with my abilities that i was born with although i think everyone has these abilities i just naturally they were just there uh I think it's the nature of the life I had as a little child that was extreme and it caused these abilities to be there to Mm -hmm. escape the extreme circumstances. So it expressed in me early. But what I'm saying here is those things come upon me like a vision and I cannot really control them. And I can say this, I don't try to control them. I probably could and i know a lot of people with these abilities that get caught into ways of controlling them by moving into drugs and alcohol and all other ways of trying to not hear the visions that come upon them but i welcome Mm -hmm. them they're holy to me they do not take over or usurp me at all they come upon me like the breath of the holy spirit and i listen yeah, I really also feel like life is happening for you. But of course, when you're experiencing a lot of traumatic things, you're not thinking, oh, this is happening for me, of course. So um, how did you get out of this um, these uh, experiences? Because um, maybe you, can, you don't have to share it, of course, but um, what did you experience uh, as a child? 
That is a long story. And I've talked about that quite a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to hear, but how did I get out? I fought my way out. I had no choice. Mm -hmm. It was life or death to me. And Mm -hmm. I fought my way out. I started running away when I was six years old. And then I actually, at the age of six, I had an incredibly amazing spiritual experience with what I call a shining one. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and so a lot of my investigation throughout my life has been trying to understand what these elder shining ones are this it changed the whole trajectory of my life it informs me every day that this that we think is so tangible and real is not and that also it gave me a sense that's where my deep sense of spirituality that you can feel in my presence came Mm -hmm. from I was kissed by that energy or embraced by that energy and it was profound. And so with that, I was able to find a sense of, um, how do I say this? I was able to find a sense of strength to move through hardships and by fighting my way out and running away, I kept running away until I was finally able to get free of the bonds. I did. And so it just led into one thing after another. And all those experiences, I'm so grateful for. One of the things that has been part of my process, and I think someone could look at the different circumstances I've gone through and want to say I was a victim of this or that. And I've never, at one point, ever, at, in, at any point, felt like I was a victim Mm -hmm. and uh, of, of childhood abuse and trafficking. I never felt that I have always felt triumphant and I've always known that those were great hurdles for me to get over. And I was aware consciously that these struggles and tribulations were part of the terrain I needed to move through to get to something better for myself, to find that gold within. And it certainly served me well, that attitude, that mentality. Now, that does not take away the ugliness. It does not take away the terror and the pain, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the all of it. I, I had to process all that like everyone else that goes through hardships. But it never... I never mentally allowed myself to be anything but triumphant joy. And that alone, that mental power kept me moving. And so I don't know where one gets that. I just know that's what, when I was under those pressures, that's what somehow I'm made of. Wow. That's so strong. Amazing. And I think it's, like you said, really easy to go into this victim role and blame the world. And you choose to live from out love anyway. So that's amazing. It, well, it, it's, you know, I realized too that we have a choice. So the couple times I would, I found myself going, why me, right? Because mm-hmm. that's a natural thing that can happen. Why, why are these troubles upon me? Why is this pain upon me? Why am I put in this situation? Those kinds of questions, the why doesn't help me in times of trouble. Why does not help me? It becomes, how do I get out? How do I keep moving forward? Uh, it, 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 there becomes another line of questioning that opens pathways to move out of it. And then in retrospect, I can look back and have and ask the question, why did these things befall me? Why were these trials on my plate that I needed to deal with? But in the moment, that has never been something that served me. The why me thing, is, it, it, it's not self, it is, it's almost a trap. And I don't know how to convey that to others. We're all on such individual processes in our life. We're all all making choices all the time. And 
I don't want to go through more trials and tribulations. I, I would like to never again. But at the same time, I feel now that every time I have gone through great hardships, I have definitely come out stronger and more self-aware and more connected to source than I, to the great mother, to the mother of God, to, to being a child of the mother of God. And that has kept me in the hardest of times. Mm. Yeah, and that's so difficult for a lot of people. They uh, they think uh, the world is so cruel and they're blaming the world. It's, it's Wow, it's amazing. And do you also feel like you choose for this life before you came to this earth? Well, I used to think that that was some, that was one of those when I when I was telling you earlier where I was exploring a lot of different territory. That mm -hmm. was one of the things that I really pulled up to and I enjoyed that idea. And it there was a lot of evidence to support it, like looking at our astrological charts as almost like a syllabus for our life and uh the pathway and i really could find a lot of meaning in this way of of navigating however in the end where i am now because this is not the end there's never an end we don't die i really believe this mm -hmm. energy does not just dissipate into nothing and so what what i found is I started to understand causality loops. I started to really look at different ideas of what what makes up the world of reality. And it started to look different than I had initially thought or in many iterations thought. And especially when I was looking at this idea of that I chose everything. And I think on a certain level, Joy, yes, I think by our actions, we do choose uh, because we're always making choices. But I believe there is something intelligent here at work. And I'm, you know, we call that God. I don't know why the great architect, there's a whole bunch of names for it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how this all works, which is the journey I'm on. But I do believe there are points in which you can avoid. And so let's look at this. Like death, for one, is a point none of us can avoid at this time. Now, transhumanism is trying to address that. However, I do believe that's a false light prophet. But mm -hmm. you are, you're here and you know in the old standard of reality that this is transient and that we all come here and we will all die and so no matter what choices you make through your life you are still going to meet that cho that's a that's a pillar you can't get around mm -hmm. it and so yeah. that suggests just that one thing alone suggests that there is some sort of destiny and that mm -hmm. that literally is a destiny with death and, you know, it's in literature and art, the dance macabre, it's always there. And mm -hmm. so I do think there is an interaction. It's like a love affair or a dance, this experience mm -hmm. of life and what we're moving through. I think that consciously on some level, and I mean, outside of our eyes, outside of niche, outside of joy, et cetera, that we are able to see more clearly from a macro view and therefore we can see that ultimately the experiences we have if we go through some hardships looking down you can see from that bigger view that bigger vantage that this these particular things will be advantageous to your spiritual growth and so some of those things that look like you might choose them before you come across the threshold into life, um, become solidified in that idea. But I, I'm not fully committed to this anymore. There's something that seems interesting to me now that's a little more nefarious, like we are in a space 
like a way station and we are in like what Dante called Purgatorio. And it and so not Paradiso or um, the Inferno, uh, the the way station in between, and there are other forces here that suggest we didn't necessarily map all this out. So I'm not a full believer in the idea of karma, but mm. I am. I definitely understand the idea of dharma and karma the way I used to think about it has lost some of its luster. I think that there's more going on, but I do, as I said earlier, I think we're, we're trapped in something unnatural at this moment. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, of course. And also when C happens, everything was, was so clear for everybody that, um, the dark side is really, uh, trying to, um, yeah, to, um, destroy us, to destroy the light. But yes, I also feel we need the dark side yes. to see the light. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, also with spiritual healing, for example, I really feel a lot of people think, okay, spiritual healing, I'm just going to heal myself and I'm going to feel better and that's it. But before you have to go to a lot of shit to go to this, yeah, healing but of course you're never gonna heal because it's a process your whole life i guess but um that's so crazy i think a lot of people think like oh spirituality oh so nice you're with the angels and that kind of stuff <laughs> it's a lot of hard work right it it well it's a lot of hard work in that it requires one to be lucid and inhabiting mm. their life and not checking out and not yeah getting lost in in one thing or another it's a balance and you know i'm one to i definitely believe that experience is an important thing we need experience and this is definitely a realm of physical experience and so i think it's important to to explore the world and all it has to offer and the good, the bad and the ugly, because without that exposure, how are we to grow? So we need, we need, we need experiences. Now the degree of experience becomes another, another conversation because, you know, one can go into say the, the world of pleasure and, and pleasure is a beautiful thing. But one can get lost in that world and and that can then rot one from within. So something that is beautiful and natural and and absolutely healing can then turn into something that is gluttonous and uh and and rotting and uh ultimately the destruction of yourself. So it's this it's this very sacred balance. And I do believe that the dark side is, you know, we're in the world of binary reality. And so the dark side is very much at play here. And there's a way to navigate the idea of that. And again, everything is so personalized. My journey will always be different than yours and yours will always be different from the next person. And that's why it's difficult when we're looking at, especially religious wise, these one, one answer for all of this stuff. It's just not that easy. It's more nuanced than that. We are more nuanced than that individually because of the choices we're making, because of the way we perceive the choices we're making, because of the way we see the world in different ways. We can all be looking at the same thing and describe it completely differently. And that should be something we revel in and work together on. But instead, mm -hmm. these gatekeepers in religion and in politics and in, in control want to tell us what we're looking at and what we're seeing and how we're seeing it. And if you're not capitulating to those standards of what it is, then you are somehow bad. You're a heretic. You are 
this or that. And, and with that comes punishments because you don't see that way or you don't believe that way. And this is the dark side. That's the emotional, spiritual, demonic, aramonic, um, you know, dark side of it that can lead into very nasty, the sicker side of things, basically. And that will yeah. lead you going into that is also very experientially rich to have because I have I have done my time being, um, you know, in the dark and uh, it is. It is it is no joke and it is not easy, but it is enriching. And I will tell you what, throughout everything, though, we have an internal light. And I'm talking about natural humans because I believe, Joy, that we're in a realm of humans and non-humans that mm. are all in these bodies that look like humans. Although we are not our bodies, you leave your body eventually. You will not have your body and you will still be you. You will still be you without yeah. your corporal body and so we i think it behooves us to look at the 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 vessels we're in as something is mm -hmm. a, a sacred temple that we inhabit but it is not it's not you it's not me and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that i find so sad when we start looking at how manipulated people get over identity politics over over mm -hmm. identity and all that because mm -hmm. we know that these are just shells that we shed. Yeah, it's all about divide and conquer, right? Yes, yes. And yeah, it's 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 not fair, and everybody is failing for it. Also with the LGBTQ plus uh, communities, you know. Yes. And of course, you can do whatever you like. You know, I'm not judging anyone. But I really feel like if you're gonna change your gender, I think a lot of people get really depressed in the end by changing. It, you know, this is an interesting, they're really flagshipping this. And, and the thing is that I believe as far as the people that change their gender, the transgendered people, I st yeah. I've always believed this. I still believe it. I think this is a very, very select and rare group of people. It always was. And that the real transgendered out there and they are out there mm -hmm. are not in your face. They're not these, they're not this agenda. And I think that needs to be recognized. It, what mm -hmm. we're seeing is definitely a takeover that has been militarized by very powerful forces to mm -hmm. shake up and get a deeper control over people at large. And I think that the biggest thing here going on is the sterilization of people, especially women's wombs. The womb, the natural womb, is the sacred portal into this space and conceptually out of this space. And what I see is a war on the womb. And mm. and that is the bigger picture here, Joy. And mm -hmm. that's why the the trans agenda with the kids and, and putting them on uh, hormone blockers and all that that sterilizes them and 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 conditioning and grooming them to think that they are something that they may not, you know, they don't they're being conditioned and groomed. Real transgendered people, just like most real homosexual people or gay people or queer people, they know this from a very early age. They may not have language for it, but they know. They know they're different. And that's one thing and that's fine. But it's when mm. the people around them are saying you're a girl, you're a boy, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're not this, you're that, or you might be this when they're grooming them. That's mm -hmm. where we have trouble. And that's where we can see an agenda. And this is a big agenda. And as I just said, the agenda is to sterilize everyone. And the war is on the womb. It's mm -hmm. on the real womb in real women. And ultimately that controls 
everything because this Mm -hmm. is how you control a population. And on a bigger spiritual level, the womb is the sacred stargate. That Mm -hmm. is how the magic happens. It's how you came in from one dimension, another realm into this material world through a natural womb as a natural human being, a spiritual being. That's how you Mm -hmm. got here. That's how I got here. And now with the synthesis of, of the digital world and biomechanics and all this, they are sterilizing all the natural wombs out there. They are killing off people and they are presenting new synthetic wombs, new non-human wombs. And that is not, a natural born human cannot come through that way. They're they're building oh, some sort of army of something that's not us. And it's mm-hmm. this is where I think the whole story is joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they cannot copy um this this spark in us, this divine. They cannot copy this, right? So they are not really human then. They're so, not human, but they're trying to yeah. we're being trapped here though. Those of us that are real are being trapped here and they're trying to extract our our soul our soul energy our um the the whatever the spark that we are the naturalness and and entrap it there's a whole bunch of stuff that i could say beyond that but they mm-hmm. are they can't do it without the natural womb without natural women And so there's a control, but see, there's a process when you're a natural person, you're, you come in through a natural womb, you Mm -hmm. actually go out through a natural womb. Birth and death are the same side. They're the same thing. It Mm -hmm. is going from one place to another and it doesn't, it's hard sometimes conceptually, I believe, this is my belief, uh, it's hard sometimes conceptually for people to understand that death is birth, but it is. It's the same process. It just seems different because you're on this end of it. And uh, well, I, I could really go into this a lot, but one, the thing that they are doing is they're, it's all synthetic out there. You, They can't. Mm. They can't give, they can't make what we are, but mm-hmm. they can put what we are into what they make. And this is how this is becoming a prison for us. Yeah. And you also said there are humans and not humans. And do you mean like reptilians or what do you mean by that? Well, I leave this open for people to conceptualize it in the way they want i'm not here to form thoughts for people but there Mm -hmm. are there are humans and there are non-humans and i i think that there's a lot of variance here so Mm -hmm. i think that there are bio organic synthetic intelligences out there Mm -hmm. that are able to mimic us and if they get into something that looks familiar, like a human body or a clone of a body, um, then they can operate like a parasite, like a spiritual or energetic, etheric parasite um, mm-hmm. would in a natural human. But these are bio, these are non These are non-biological, these are technological entities with an intelligence to them and and possibly even a sense of or the appearance of sentience, but not in the way that we are. And this is one of the things I think when all this went down in the last three years, I believe, and this is why the testing and all this was important, was there was a genetic um database set up and so people weren't doing enough with the databases say through uh genealogy and stuff like that to 
satisfy the needs of people collecting this data, that whatever it is, the people, the entities, organizations collecting our genetic data as a whole, all across the realm, because there is a raking of these bloodlines to find certain activated genetics because they can be dormant and passed down in a family for centuries even. And then you get that special one that is activated, say, now, but it didn't activate in the brother or the sister or the mother or the father or the grandfather, just like a redheaded gene or a, a green gene in your eye, whatever, you know, just how genetics work. And, and so it was about categorizing basically the herd of people, of humans, alleged humans, and trying to look for something specific. Now, I think the specific thing is the soul consciousness that we house that's natural and organic. And that is what was being looked for so that they could extract that like they do with, say, the whole idea of adrenochrome. I mean, so they can extract this that we are, our soul consciousness. I know a lot of people don't think that's possible, but I do think that's possible. And it's it's riddled throughout literature. It's riddled throughout nonfiction. I mean, they even put it in the dark crystal where mm -hmm. they're, you know, the crystal sucking out the soul essence of those little podlings or anything that it gets contact with. They were using something powerful and beautiful for the dark side. And mm -hmm. that, I think, was the whole point of the last three years. And then what's going on now is the cleanup, like kill off who they don't need, close as many of the natural portals as possible, the sterilization situation, and track those with this specific genetic that they're looking for. And it's scattered all across the realm, across cultures, etc. And so it's very specific. And in doing so, I do believe that they are also creating creating more. So with the different versions of the injections they gave people, some are going to kill, soft kill with the prions and all the different stuff, you know, terrorizing the immune system, et cetera. There, there's a death, there's a genocide going on for sure. Then there were the placebos and i believe the placebos were given to key people very specific i believe the placebos were given to those with these genes that they're looking for this specific activated genetic and then there was the other one that is going to interface with with one's biology and transform it so basically by inserting a larvae or an egg and getting it directly into the human system and like a parasite, it's going to parasite the shell of the person, but still keep absolute control of all of the frontal cortex, all of the memories and the higher thinking so that it can manipulate and activate that so that that person is not, uh, is still recognizable to the people around them, but the parasite's getting what it needs. And within that, there's a subset of those that it's going to change their biology altogether. And they are going to actually change into something different. Their, mm -hmm. their form is act. They are actually going to change. Now, I don't know how that looks. I don't know if it's a ghoulish thing. I don't know. And in all of this, in the, in one of the categories earlier I was talking about, there is the, and this has been coming forward, the receipts are coming forward. There is the separation of, well, there's a deterioration of the pineal and the uh, pituitary glands. And so they're doing autopsies and the some sometimes these glands are completely gone. They've just been eaten out 
And this is what we've been told, at least, in, in conceptually, especially strong case for it, looking at Egypt and Sumer and then all the sciences and religious sciences, that that is your connection to God and spirituality. And so if you affect that, and we know this with fluoride and the calcification, the whole thing, all the ways in which we got to this idea that those are very sacred glands. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so if you connect, disconnect one from their spiritual being, you are halfway there to extracting whatever that is. And in that process, though, you can turn a spiritual, beautiful, natural human into something ghoulish and uh, like a psychopath, right? Or a deep, a heavy narcissist that has yeah. no connection to empathy, no connection to anything that would make them seem human that the, the yeah. qualities that give us our humanity and so that can look very scary and then also the shutting down of the the frontal cortex the frontal neocortex and getting and expanding the amygdala in the back and you know we're seeing all these stories of violence and then there's this whole cannibal culture that's rising up this is all at play joy Oh, it's so crazy because I also had a narcissist, a narcissist expert on my podcast, and she was also telling that it's really like narc season. There's a lot of narcissistic people around us right now that's testing us, and um, and I really feel like sometimes these people don't even look human. You know, you don't really feel a connection sometimes to these people. I don't think they are human. That's yeah. my case. They they are in human bodies. That's what I'm saying. It's the human form is the Trojan horse. They yeah. are it's like I think one of the easiest ways to conceptualize this is look at the look at Star Trek, the movies and the series how I mean just Spock he was very humanoid if you take away his ears, right? He looks like a human and he was not. And he's a good guy. We we like Spock, but he has he's literally a different race on Star Trek, right? As opposed yeah. to Captain Kirk, who is a human. And so it doesn't all have to be nefarious, but it is it does need to be made clear that they are not human and narcissists and psychopaths are, I, I view them in the same way. They are not the same race as us. And mm -hmm. there is a way to change one into the other to, well, to take, to deduce, to take that, which is special in humans mm -hmm. away. Yeah. And what yeah. do you get? You get the narcissist, you get the psychopath. And now you have something that is vastly different from us that really does not care about us. And whatever mm -hmm. it can gain from us is really the agenda. Otherwise, they do not care about us in the least bit. Mm -hmm. And I really feel also sometimes you can see it in their eyes. They look dead. I don't know if you ever saw that in, in a narcissistic person. but Yes. I'm you seeing it really more and more too, more and more yeah. everywhere we go. Yeah, it's it's so crazy. Like sometimes I look into someone's eyes and I think, oh my God, this is so scary. I feel right away that's, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's well, it's, and a lot, everyone's noticing this joy and it's, mm -hmm. it's something, see, your, your body, your, your bodies, your emotional body is informing you. Your psychic body is informing you that you are in the presence of a non-human that does not care about you. So, it, you know, it, a narcissist will only engage if it serves them. Mm -hmm. And same with a psychopath. Now, there's a there's a there's some differences there, but there are hybrids of the two. And mm -hmm. um, and so you could be getting raped right in front of one of these beings and they won't unless it serves them to stop you stop it they won't mm -hmm. now a normal natural human will do what they can and when they're seeing an atrocity they will call at least call for help or something they will get involved in some way to help these non-humans will not unless it serves their needs mm -hmm. we are nothing more than 
than a means to an end. And they are very cold, very chilly, and they are growing in number. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that too, for sure. I really feel like we can uh, talk for hours. I really like uh, to, to chat with you, but um, I would like to wrap it up for now. Maybe we can uh, do another episode in the future. It would be my pleasure. This has been a lovely experience. I thank you for having me on here, Joy. Yeah, of course. And everybody has to listen to the Obelix podcast, of course, and to the Cosmic Saloon. I will put all the links in the description. Uh, But before we end this podcast, uh, do you maybe have some nice words to uh, share with the audience? Yes, always. It's important to trust yourself and start that practice we were talking about earlier of just sit in a comfortable chair and allow yourself to daydream. And as you're daydreaming, allow the thoughts that come into your head to be there and move out as they may until you get into a space of nothingness. And in that nothingness, you can find God. Do it. It's a wonderful practice. It's a healing practice and it can take you to great heights. So find the stillness and daydream. I love that. Thank you so much. For thank you, Joy. Words. Thank you for being on my podcast and thank you everyone for listening. And I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.